Hi everyone, welcome. This is Deepa Iyer. I am excited to be here with all of you. Um, welcome to Building Movement Project and Solidarity Is. And um, it's so great to see folks join. Thank you for being here. As you're joining, please tell us in the chat a little bit about who you are. Um, tell us where you're calling from, not calling from, coming in from, whatever the word is, right? And um, let us know, yeah, who you are and where you are joining us from. That's the right way to say it. So this is Deepa Iyer. I am with Building Movement Project and Solidarity Is. I'm really excited that you all are here. For um, those of you who are part of the Solidarity Semester, good to see you again. This is week three of our five-week online series where we are talking about social change, we are talking about the principles of solidarity practice, and we're talking about the urgent calls to action and the generational moments that we are living through right now. For those of you who are not part of the Solidarity Semester, I urge you to get involved. You can still join us, you can still register, and you can uh, join us for the next two weeks of sessions that we have, which happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays we are on Zoom, and Thursdays we are right here on the Building Movement Project's Instagram, where we are in conversation with a movement leader. And as I said, you can still register, um, you can still join us, and uh, we hope that you will. You can take a look at all of our resources and our video chats um, and everything that we're producing online at www.solidarityis.org. So yeah, so folks are coming in from Florida. I saw Austin, Cleveland, Boston. Welcome. We're so glad to see you again. If you're coming in to join us, let us know um, who you are, where you're joining us from. Eugene, Oregon. That's wonderful. More Cleveland. Wow. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited that folks are here. And um, as I said earlier, um, for those of you who are still joining in, I am with Solidarity Is and Building Movement Project, and we are here to talk about um, the Solidarity Semester. We're here to talk about how we can engage in social change and transformative solidarity practice. Um, I think someone said something earlier. Let me go back here. I had the worst day and then I remembered solidarity semester was today and that turned it all around. Oh, well, hope that your day gets a little bit brighter and better and hope that we can contribute to that with our conversation. Um, Las Cruces, New Mexico, joining from Chicago. So just waiting for folks to join. And as you're joining, let us know where you are joining from. And I am going to be bringing in our movement faculty member in just a second. And I'm so pleased that she's with us. Hi, Judith. Hey, how are you? Good. You are in a car. I yes, I am in a car. I am traveling from uh, New Orleans to, uh, to D.C. You're not driving the car, obviously. No, um, my husband is driving. Say hi, it's Jerry. Hello. Hey, how are you? <laughs> so yeah, we are um, just dropped our daughter at college, and so I'm sorry that we are we're driving. That's okay. Congratulations to Jack. Thank you. Very it's exciting. Amazing. She's going to be playing D1 basketball. You know, this is her dream. So. Um, we're like, you know, very proud of her. She's been playing since she was three. So I, know, I see all these pictures. You yeah, so I think that's right. I've been a mama, you know, basketball mom to my heart. So this is a um a truly big deal for her. So it's good. How are you, Zita? I'm okay. I'm okay. It's good to see you. Although I wish it weren't like this and we could actually... We could be in the same room, right? Yes, yes. Because it mm -hmm. has been a while. But thank it you for doing been. this. Thank you for joining yeah. us while you're on the road. Love it. Love it. I'm glad to, glad to be here. 
Yeah, so I was telling folks who are joining us, um, please feel free to let us know in the comments where you're joining from. We've got folks from all around the country, Judith, for mm -hmm. here. And as yep. you know, a lot of these folks are part of the Solidarity Semester, which is this online series we've been doing that is focused on um, young folks, 18 to 25 years of age, mm -hmm. probably like yep. the Jack's age range, and who are interested in learning about solidarity and social mm -hmm. change. Um, so yep. that's why we're here. And I'm so glad that you're here. We've had um, a conversation like this with Grisa Martinez from United mm -hmm. We Dream. We also had one last week with Janine Komenode from the National Urban Indian Family Coalition. So it's great mm -hmm. to have you. Yep. And again, Judith is with the National Office of the Advancement Project. Um, so let's just get started and get into it. Um, so I wanted to ask you actually first, um, mm -hmm. well, just so everyone knows, you probably figured it out, but Judith is a friend of mine. She's a movement sister. She's a mentor. That's, like, that's the only way she's putting up with somebody being in a car. <laughs> You knew you could get away with that with me. Oh, um, and um, what I wanted to ask you, but she's so much more than that, we'll talk about it. I mean, she's, as I said, she's executive director of the National Office of the Advancement Project, uh, but also a voting rights lawyer, um, somebody who's pioneered a lot of the work when it comes to the school to prison pipeline and dismantling it. So we're going to talk about some of those victories. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about... Um, what solidarity means. And with Judith, as I was tweeting out, I kept saying, you're going to get real talk, right? Because Judith yep. does not mince any words. Nope. Never. And so all you're going to get is, is actual real talk. So let's start. Um, so I wanted to ask you actually a little bit about, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the young folks are living through generational moments, right? right. Where folks are feeling mobilized, wanting to take action. When you look back on your life, what are some of those generational moments that made it really clear to you, you know mm -hmm. what, I'm, I'm going to work on racial justice and this is where my path is? Yeah, good question. Um, well, you know, first I think because my, my mother was an activist um, and was, um, started me early. My first, my first protest was three, right? Um, and yes, I remember it to this day because I remember the chant. Um, and also because she, um, because of that, and because my father was in the army, segregated army, right? Mm -hmm. Race was always a conversation in my household, right? So it was, you know, it was a thing. But I think I also during like college, um, I was in college at a time when people were fighting um, apartheid, right? Um, and on college campuses, we were also fighting just racism, right? Mm -hmm. So I was a student organizer at University of Pennsylvania um, and was, you know, knew that, like, you can't sit on the sidelines. It didn't matter how old you are, if you can vote, not vote, et cetera, you can't sit on the sidelines. Um, my first election show my age now, um, was when uh, what Jesse Jackson was running. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. But that was a little while ago. Um, and but really important. Really important. Moment. Very important. Really important to see a black man on the ticket. And I, you know, that was one of those people that my, my mom always took me with her to vote. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to go into in, and close that curtain, that was what you did back then, close the curtain and vote for a black man for president was, you know, or for the, to be the nominee, right, um, was incredible. And so so I think, you know, there, there are always these flashpoints, right, um, whether it was something that was on campus, then when I was in law school, mm -hmm. the same thing, fighting racism as a, as a student, but also as the um, chair, national chair of the Black Law Students Association, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I also, like, you know, grew up in New York, so, like, um, Eleanor Bumpers was killed, right, mm -hmm. um, so the Central Park Five happened when I was in law school, and, like, I was in a law school, I was at Columbia Law School at the time, mm -hmm. um, and I'm a New Yorker, and we didn't talk about the Central Park Five in our criminal law class. So I think, you know, like wow. there's, there's like, first of all, there are the moments, but then there's the also like these moments where you see the oversight and the fact that people are not talking about race, where you're like, oh, no, like there's clearly something wrong here because we need to be talking about this. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just say that it was an, an aggregation of things in my life, also being a, um, a victim of discrimination on the job um, mm -hmm. after college. Um, that made me know that, like, 
even though I had taken a little bit of a detour for a moment, right? But oh, I should go into corporate America for a hot minute. Um, um, after college, that like um, God brought me back mm. and like put me back on my path and on my purpose um, towards freedom of my people. Yeah, and you are totally aligned with your sacred purpose, as I like to say, because <laughs> every time I speak to you and have heard you speak, mm -hmm. it is so clear. Um, no. But that was, thanks for sharing that, because I didn't mm -hmm. know all of that, Judith, about mm -hmm. you. I didn't realize it was something from, you know, when you were so young, right? Yeah. The age of yeah. three onwards. Um, and if folks have questions for Judith, I know more folks have been joining in the last couple of minutes. I am in conversation with Judith Brown Dianas of the Advancement Project, and we'll talk a little bit about the Advancement Project too. But Judith was just sharing um, her own kind of trajectory and her movement into social change work and racial justice work. And so much of it, you know, as I heard you talk about it, is based on the relationships and community you were building on campus and law mm -hmm. school and what you were hearing in the news and being in, or surrounded by. So again, encouraging folks to be engaged and to right. bring what you're hearing into the classroom, into the remote classroom, um, to the extent that you right. can. It's so important. Um, so I, I guess I want to talk a little bit or hear you talk a little bit about the Advancement Project. Um, mm -hmm. so we're getting some questions already, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but um, when you, in your work right now at the Advancement Project, what would you say are the, the top priorities that especially younger folks need to be aware of in this current climate right now? Hmm. Oh boy, um, there's so many. Um, so I would say, I mean, first of all, so I would put at top of the list, the police state, mm -hmm. right? So if we think about it, it's, um, we've seen, of course, the police violence, um, the killing of George Floyd, um, and Breonna Taylor and so many others, Bashar Brooks, et cetera. Um, but like, we have to think about it as a bigger picture of the police state. And that bigger picture means we've also seen it in the way of repression against protesters, right? So, and we've also seen it in the attacks on our undocumented neighbors um, with ICE. And so, you know, and we've also seen it with police in schools. And so the idea that the government is being used as a tool to control us um, and to maintain power of white people is to me like a priority, right? And so it's not just like, let's not just fight ICE, let's not just fight um, the local police, et cetera, but it's this whole system mm -hmm. of control and repression um, which is, should be a priority of ours. And, and, but I think it's also like, it is something that is multiracial, right? It, it hits our Muslim brothers and sisters. It, you know, it's like all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Who are not white folks, right? Are impacted by this system of the police state. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get to the other priorities in a minute, but I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things I often hear people say is, given the uprisings that have happened, right, um, what have been some of the victories in terms of dismantling the police state? And I feel like you all have been doing so much of that work when it comes to the school to prison pipeline, cops in schools. So can yeah. you share a little bit of where have some of the victories happened and um, how has solidarity sort of played a role in that? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the work sort of Vancouver Project National Office, we have for, since the very beginning, because um, I've been there since the beginning, done work um, to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. And part of that work has more recently, probably in the, we've done work around police in schools for a number of years and put out kind of like the first reports on the existence of police in schools. But we also um, have probably in the past three years, we started a national campaign with the Alliance for Educational Justice and a number of grassroots organizations that are youth organizing groups. So when I'm saying youth, I don't mean like 35 year old youth. I mean like the, you know high school students who are who are fighting back against um, the existence of police in our schools. And so um, when um, George Floyd was killed and the Minneapolis School Board voted to get police out of their schools. Um, that was a moment of victory for our movement. 
um, it wasn't something that just happened out of the blue, right? Young people have been pushing for this and we've been working to change the narrative, right? And so all of the years of talking about how having police in schools is the same, you know, you, if we can't trust the police on the streets, we shouldn't be tr trusting the same police to be in the hallways of our schools. And so that was a moment of recognition for young people who had been calling this out. And so um, we saw that it happened not only in uh, Minneapolis, but then some of our partners in Madison, Wisconsin, Freedom Inc. Yes. holding it down in Rochester, in Oakland. Oakland, Oakland, really important black organizing project actually got rid of the police department in their schools. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a contract, it was a police department in San Francisco, Coleman Advocates. Um, and so we've been seeing these wins, which is incredible. And, and it's like wins towards a vision of abolition, right? Yes. Not just reform, but abolition. And young people did that, right? And I'm, I'm really honored to support them um, because they're very clear on their vision um, and what needs to happen. And despite the fact that they don't have voting power, they're still able, um, able to win. And so we still have these fights going on in places like Chicago and, um, and Pennsylvania and in Philly. Um, but we've seen also some places where the budgets for, for a school police have also been reduced. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really important that those, those wins are wins of the people, right? And that what we did was while we have been working on this for quite some time, what we saw was an opportunity for our movement to, to like walk into that space mm -hmm. and really take on, take on the issue and, and push it um, you know, more aggressively. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing those wins. I mean, I feel like uh, every time I would read about them, right, I would feel this rush of yes. Um, but I just wanted to pick out a couple of things you said that are so important, especially for folks who are thinking about getting involved, right? One of the things you said is it didn't happen out of the blue. The uprisings created like an opportunity for mm -hmm. people to push something that they had been working on for years, right? And I think but. that's really important that we we. A lot of folks see the uprisings and them opening up something, right? But the win has been in motion for years and years. And that's, that's right. something we've been trying to talk about a lot, about right. um, the fact that solidarity practice is really about relationship building and trust. And it takes a long time to kind of do that and build it. So, um, you know, can I, I do, I yeah. do want to, I didn't, I didn't talk about the solidarity piece. So this is the other thing is that the police free schools movement, Mm -hmm. um, is a, um, a space for solidarity, right? Because also, you know, we're, we're doing work across place and within that, the groups who are coming to the table are groups that we, you know, we have undocumented students, we have, um, Muslim students, we, you know, it is, and, and I have to say this, that I think like in the youth space in particular, solidarity work is like, like second nature, right? Yeah. It's like people, like people don't really, I mean, like really, really have to think about it. It's not like a hard muscle to develop. Um, and I guess, I don't know if that's the generation or what. I hope so. I hope so. And it, 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 it is, I've noticed that too. It is like secondhand or second nature for a lot of people. Um, so yeah. there's a question I wanted to ask you from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, what would you say is the most important piece of advice that you would give to young activists, especially in regard to the uprising um, for Black Lives right now? Yeah, um, so I, I would say um, a few things. Number one, I want to say that for young people who are in the street, I just want to say how brave um, young people are to be out there, right? Because going toe to toe with the police is no joke, right? because we know how powerful they are and how they, you know, have like power that is like pretty incredible, right? And so I think that's number one. Um, and so I want to honor that because I also think that young people are, have always been the ones on the front lines. You can think about the civil rights movement and like the, the children's crusade, young people being out in the street and being hosed down and like, you know, just like understanding that our freedom, right, even at a young age is so important. And so young people, you know, keep doing that, right? Um, two is, um, 
you know, take care of yourself, right? <laughs> like, that is important. Um, not that I practice self-care very well as I'm doing this from a car, right? Um, <laughs> but um, self-care is important. Um, and I think just to be, like really to be in your purpose. Like don't lose, lose uh, you know, when you do movement work, movement work can be messy, right? Like the internal of the movement work can be messy. But if you stay on your goal and on your purpose, and like people in our in our office know that I always say, look, I'm just trying to get free. Like when things get bad, like I'm like, I'm just trying to get free. So we bring it back to mm -hmm. what this is about. Um, the yeah. other thing I would say is don't get caught up in the ego, right? And I guess yeah. that, that's kind of a similar point of like, um, there's, there is a, a, and I guess because of social media, et cetera, there is a, a way in which people want to be, um, to be rewarded by how many followers I have, yeah. how many, but don't be rewarded by that. Be rewarded by the work. Be rewarded by how, how much closer you're pushing us to freedom. Um, you know, like a lot of people don't know who the heck I am. And I don't really care because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build infrastructure. I'm trying to support good work. I'm trying to win. And yes. so you may not know my name. That's okay. Um, but have I moved the ball on some mm -hmm. things? And, you know, I'm like, because I take notes and I, and I am a believer in the elevator school. And so for me, it's about the strategy. For me, it's about the people on the front lines. It's about the genius of ordinary people, right, to be right. able to win this. And so um, don't get caught up in the you and being out front and who's got the speaker and who's, who's that's not that's not what our journey towards freedom is about. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So stay aligned with your purpose, right? Freedom, mm -hmm. liberation, whatever it is. Um, don't let the movement get you down because it is messy and mm -hmm. don't get your ego caught up in it. And I, I think it's so important to also create community because I think that's how we check ourselves. Yes. We hold each other accountable and, you know, we are able to actually know we're not alone in this. And that's right. um, you're one of the people that I think of when I think of my community, right, in my ecosystem. So I think that's yeah. so important as well. Yeah, um, I think community is, is hell of important and feeling like there are people out there who have your back and then also like you know checking in with people right because we're going through a going through a hell of a time right now that no one would have ever expected um we've lost a lot of people people in their own families have lost people and so we just need to do those check-ins um just to say hey how you doing you don't have to say much much else but i was i was thinking about you you know because there's a lot of isolation that people are experiencing right now um you know i'm a person who is used to like being in an office i miss being in an office yeah because i like the energy of like my team and so that's hard and um and i'm sure it's hard for other people you know and i've had distractions like taking my daughter to college right that's been a distraction for two weeks now <laughs> um but it is um but being able to reach out to people and you know and and you you get what you give in this work right and if you totally. love up on people and you support people they give it back and do it with a pure heart not about a motivation or any bad intention Absolutely. It's so true. Because, yeah, it's liberation liberations about love, right? And so yeah. acting in that. And I want to say that I know you love, I know you love me because I'm in the car. And, and you didn't, you didn't cut me off and say, Judy, we are going to have to reschedule this because are you crazy? You're in Alabama on a road to, <laughs> to Maryland and your husband's talking and it's still okay. I will take you however I can have you. So it's not a thing, Judy. Um, but as just mentioned, she's in a car uh, joining us uh, because she just took her daughter to college. Yay! Um, it was amazing in New Orleans, amazing place, and is heading back um, home. So um, I'm so excited you could still make time for us while you're of in course. the car. Of course. <laughs> so all of you for joining and watching our conversation. Um, so we're talking about solidarity. We're talking about social change. We're talking about movements. And um, again, we just talked a little bit about um, dismantling the uh, police state and the school to prison pipeline. Um, and then you were saying there are a couple of other priorities, right? That folks yeah. need to be thinking about when it comes to, oh, oh, I love all these congratulations to Jack that are coming to your daughter. Yay. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> She's wonderful. playing basketball at University of New Orleans, privateers. <laughs> No privateers. Awesome. I don't even know what a privateer is. He's also like a fantastic singer. 
Yeah, she's a singer. And that's why that's why it's good to be in New Orleans because I'm like, you better get on stage and sing and get that contract because you know my. Mama needs to retire from this work, Tina Knowles style. So, oh, no pressure, no pressure at all. No pressure. <laughs> Someone has asked what your daughter's favorite basketball team is. Um, hmm. she, I don't know if she's a favorite basketball team, but like she loves Steph Curry. So, all yeah, right. I wouldn't and say that's her favorite team, but the work never stops. It's just been amazing. Well, thank you. We're glad that you. Uh, we're glad that you're with us on the road. <laughs> when students come to Annis. Okay, so my um, the next question is, what else, right? This man, there's so much going on, so you, so that's one. Um, what are a couple of other um, issues that are top of mind to advancement project that young folks can also get involved with? Um, there's an election. I don't know if y'all heard. 32 days left. Um, so voting rights, as we know, voter suppression is like hot and heavy, but every word that comes out of Trump's mouth nowadays is yeah. voter suppression, right? Uh, and so being able to make sure that people can vote um, freely and safely in this election, right? In a pandemic, it's like, it's a different problem. And, and confusion, um, voter confusion is something. And so, um, you know, uh, Tram Yoon, who is the head of New Virginia Majority, said something oh, today. Yes. Um, on a, we did a press call today that I think is really important. And she said that um, voter turnout is going to be the way that we overcome voter suppression. And I think that that is right. Um, I litigated the, um, the case um, of NAACP versus Harris in the 2000 election representing African American voters. And I can tell you that. Um, you know, after an election, it's too late to litigate the election, right, and what happened to voters. And so we really just, we have to turn out our people. And so I think for young people, like, are you going to be a poll worker? Are you going to be a mm -hmm. poll watcher, right? Like, sign up with the party or a candidate to be on the inside, because on the inside is where the that ish happens, right? So that's really important. Um, and then making sure you're turning out people, because we have a lot of people who, our communities are living in despair, yeah. real despair because of COVID, because of feeling like we get no justice when we get killed and it's caught on video. And so how do we make sure that our people are actually turning out in like record numbers despite that, right? Mm -hmm. And so we know that, for example, black males, like the, the number of black males who actually want to engage this year is down. Yeah. We know that voter registration is down already because we didn't have the agencies open, like the you know state agencies to do voter registration. And so mm -hmm. that, so being able to turn out our people you know, this is like, get your cousins, get your family. You know, you know people who ain't going to vote, who say they ain't going to vote. You got to go get those people because there's too much at stake. And so yeah. I think being able to do the turnout, being able to educate people and help them. Um, and then, you know, there'll be lawyers like me who will be fighting the fight in the courts if we have to. Um, yeah. And then I think the, so the other plan, issue. Make a plan. Yeah, to, oh, make a plan. Oh, yes. sorry. I just, there are a couple of questions. Um, Jude, let me ask you. Flash you for a sec. Okay, as Judith is coming back online, um, there are three things I wanted to mention that she said, one being the importance of voting ourselves, right, if we're able to vote. Secondly, make a plan to help other folks vote. And thirdly, um, figure out how to protect the vote and defend the vote um, by being um, a poll watcher or an election monitor of some sort. And there are many organizations that are doing this. Um, and Judith, I'm wondering if you could share like a couple of organizations that folks can look into like uh, that, you know, if they want to be um, defending or preserving the vote. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think if you want to volunteer, there's the Election Protection Coalition um, that runs a hotline and has poll monitors. And then in the states, there are local like civic engagement groups. Like we work with New Florida Majority, New Virginia Majority, um, who are always looking for volunteers. Um, the labor unions are usually out, right, and helping voters. Um, and so they'll both both be outside the polling place helping people. And then, like I said, the 1866 hour vote 
is the hotline that people can sign up to um, help out on too. And then, you know, there's groups like us. We don't really take volunteers, but we'll be out there, that's for sure. Um, make it, and working with grassroots organizations. New Georgia Project is another one that will be out there. Um, so yeah, so we've just got to find some group locally um, and also sign up to be poll workers. But, you know, like I said, poll workers and poll watchers, I really, because there's been a push for poll workers, but we also need people to sign up with parties and candidates. Yes, that's it. And I love, um, I think it was Countessa who wrote, I am literally filling out my ballot right now. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, Good for you. Great. Keep doing Good it, you. everyone. You know um, what, Deepa? I think Deepa in, in Maryland, where we are, right? I'm getting an email to me. And then I can just print it out and drop it off or I can mail it in. So, you know, this is the thing is that is the is the problem with our democracy is that um, depending on where you live, either you have yes. democracy or you don't. Right. right. And so um, it, this is the thing that we really have to fix in, a, in addition to the disenfranchisement of people with felony convictions. Right. Yes. Because we know that that is a Jim Crow law um, that exists because white people, white men with land wanting to disenfranchise newly freed slaves. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, someone else wrote, I think the Black Voters Fund is looking for volunteers to work text shifts. Great. So there are a number of um, I, um, opportunities that we've shared mm -hmm. and that have been shared in the chat too. Please continue to do that um, for folks to vote, get your people to vote, right? Your, your, your community mm -hmm. to vote and then figure out a way that you can actually defend the vote on election day. Um, those key yeah. things, um, if we can all commit to, that says a lot, right, about what we're able That's to right. do. That's um, right. So here, a couple more questions, and then I'll let you go since you're on the road. Um, the next question is really honestly about, so we talked in the last uh, solidarity uh, class we had on Tuesday, we talked about the importance of becoming co-conspirators and really thinking about liberation as mutual liberation and co-liberation, right? And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why it's so important for us to um, commit ourselves to ending anti-Black racism, particularly for non-Black people of color and for white folks. Why, has, why must that be sort of like a primary commitment that we make if we are engaging in solidarity practice? Yeah, I, you know, I think that um, it's the history of this country, right? It's like the thing that is, um, drives us to, to understand that anti-Black racism has to be key. You know, both um, what has happened to Black people in this country and Indigenous folks in this country um, has to be centered. And um, because all of the, the systems have been built on that, our whole damn government has been yes. built on that every damn system, whether it's housing or the criminal legal system, um, or if it's um, the way in which we get into college or don't get into college, and affirmative action, affirmative action, while it benefits white women, right? It was, you know, like it wasn't meant for them initially, right? And now it's being taken away because right. people knew, know that black people started to make progress. And so I think we just, we have to be clear that there is such um, hate for black people in this country and that if black people don't get free, we, none of us will be really will free. Get free. Right. And yeah. so, um, so it is important because if, if we can fight um, on behalf of and with and next to, um, and I don't mean behalf of in a paternalistic way because I'm not down with that, um, but uh, with Black people I hear and you. center the fight, then we will, we will all win because we will dismantle um, hundreds of years of a system that actually has oppressed us all, right? Even though we, we don't see it that way. We don't all see it that way, I should say. Yeah, well, we should because there are through lines between all of it, you know. Oh, definitely. Like, and that's between... why I think the solidarity work is right because because actually in solidarity circles we understand the commonality. We understand the ways in which the system has worked against against us, right? And it may be very different in the or to the magnitude that it's not an oppression Olympics kind of thing, right? But it is that. This, these systems that were put in place to repress and, and oppress Black people have impacted 
um, our other, you know, yes. uh, our other brothers and sisters of color. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Saying that you are in the fight to end anti-black racism doesn't mean you're not also ending the fight or in the struggle to address right. anti-Asian racism or Islamophobia or uh, right. Right, xenophobia um, or transphobia. It just means that we understand and recognize that systems of oppression have been built on anti-black racism and indigenous invisibility and genocide for um, the, this whole country's existence. And so um, understanding that is so crucial in order to fight all of the systems of oppression, right. as you said, so we can all get free. Um, so thank you for that. And you know, you unwittingly named a lot of these principles that we've been talking about, like centering, commonalities, collaboration, mm -hmm. like these are the things we've been talking about during the solidarity semester. And it isn't easy, right? Like it's not like you just, you, you learn about it or hear about it or read about it and you do it. And so we also mm -hmm. say that solidarity is a verb, like it's a practice, it's a mm -hmm. strategy. And so That's you right. have to practice it over and over again. Um, That's right. And so, it's not always easy, right? Let's, let's be clear. It's not messy. always easy. Yeah, it, it, is, it is messy. Um, but when you build trust with people, and you build relationships, then and you start to care about the people in your circle, then you can work through the the messiness of it, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But and you and you you have to listen. You have to listen, listen and love the people that you're in the work with. Yeah, and um, oftentimes you have to like admit that you've made mistakes. You don't know something and force correct that's yourself. Right. Um, that is right. Okay. So another question that's coming in, people who have questions, feel free to put them into the chat, is um, what has been your biggest challenge in your work? Mm, biggest challenge? Um, there have been so many challenges. But I would, I would say one of the biggest challenges has been um, being a Black woman who leads a national organization. Mm um you know it's, it's hard first of all being a leader of a national organization or any organization is lonely right like being an executive director is a lonely thing you know that deeply yeah. you've been there done that um and um it also being a black woman um in a world and a, 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 where philanthropy is racist right um yeah. And people like really will they invest in organizations where they believe in the leader of the organization and then believe in the people who look like them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the white guys who can come in and have an idea and they're like, oh, let's give them, let's give them thirty million dollars, and like you're like, uh, that idea wasn't that smart, right? <laughs> like, like wah, wah. <laughs> but but they're like yeah. trying to invest in it anyway because they think these white guys can do it, right? Um, and white women, and so I think that that has been hard because when you when when you are working on your purpose and you are working for freedom and you think everybody should be like supporting you but like because yeah. you're a little bit self-righteous and like well why wouldn't you believe in this and so i think that 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 has been hard um feeling like at times there's like um a space where where people think your organization should only be but so big because they actually don't want you to win they don't believe it i mean because they kind of believe in you but they actually don't know that they actually want your vision to actually be the winner, right? Because yeah. it may mean it may mean something for their power, right? And so I think that's I think that's been hard. Um, so how do you how do you keep it going? How do you keep your vision? How do you stay aligned with your vision and purpose in an environment like that, right? Where folks are either like questioning or doubting or asking you to jump through like a million hoops to show that yeah this is what is yeah. important to my people and to really everybody how do you stay aligned with your purpose in that environment? um so i always say this just do the work when you do the work and you do it out, out of purpose and you do it out of mission and you do it out of the love for your people um and you really do the work i don't mean bs doing the work i mean like roll up your damn sleeves and do the work um you're gonna make progress, right? And then people will see. They, yeah. They'll see. You know, like I think about this moment um, after George Floyd was killed, um, you know, and white guilt set in, and then all of a sudden, like all this money was moving to black organizations. You know, our organization doesn't have the biggest name, 
But we got calls from people like, actually, we did our research and you all do good work. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm glad y'all finally figured that ish out, right? And so, um, so that's good. And white guilt is fleeting, so we know that too. So you won't be back in the next three years, but okay. Um, mm-hmm. But I think you do the work and your yeah. work speaks for itself. When you make a progress and you're true to your people and, you, and, and, and true to like your people in a way that is authentic, and where your people, where like on the, especially grassroots folks, mm-hmm. you you work with them and they and they say good things. They're like, yes, we want that support. We love working with you. It speaks for itself. Yeah. Just, you got to just do the right thing, do the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And it also reminded me of our mutual friend, Allison Brown. I feel like Allison said that a lot doing yeah. the work, yeah. getting it done. So just wanted to take a moment to remember her yeah. while we're here today. Yeah. Our friend, our friend. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Um, and this, we'll make this the last question. I know you're so, you're so kind to like do your time. Um, and, and I am so glad. I got, girl, I got, we can do this for 16 hours. We got 16 hours. <laughs> right. no, I'm just kidding. I I'll see if I can, but then I'll come back. Uh, okay. um, right. The question is, can you speak a bit more on abolition versus reform? And I'm so glad this question came up because I meant to like pin it above later, but uh, earlier when you spoke about the classroom. So why don't you yeah. talk about that, but also maybe give specifics of when people think about, okay, no cops in schools, what does that get replaced with, right? Mm-hmm. What yeah. is that vision? Yeah, so um, the vision is um, schools where young people are um, nurtured and where they can thrive and where the adults in the building care for them in a way that we all care for our own children. And um, when you put police in a school building, there's a culture clash, right? Because they're law enforcement. They enforce the law. And not just the law, but criminal codes, right? And so... Um, abolition in the school context means that we have no police in schools, but what we do is that we build strong relationships between the people in the building. Um, that means the adults and the children and the parents, and that we use restorative justice practices as a way of not, as, you know, people think of restorative justice as a thing that's like, oh, it's instead of punishment. No, it's a whole culture of a, of, in, that's used in a school. From the moment a young person hits the door, and somebody says good morning, and somebody says how how are you? How are you doing? When they notice that something is something is off with someone, that's a restorative justice culture. It's not just about oh I take responsibility for my actions. You take responsibility, you know. And we, you know, that I mean that it's that too, but it is about the relationships and a culture of caring that mm-hmm. we want to see in schools. And police are not trained to care; they um, are trained to do law and order. Um, when it comes to children of color and people of color. Uh, and so they can't exist in the kind of environment that we want for young people um, to thrive in. And I think that extends to our communities too, right? When we think of abolition in our communities of the police in general, it is that we want something different where our people are cared for, right. not, not just crimi- not criminalized. Not criminalized and not punished and not assumed right. to be criminals and terrorists and lawbreakers, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Um, So with that, I think I'm going to close this out by asking you a final question, which is, um, what are you going to do after the election? So what what assumptions are you making in that? Are, so okay. are the How about assumptions for, for your care and sustainability what will you be doing i'm not making any assumptions on what will happen okay but. so i'm so i'm gonna make i'm gonna make the assumption that there's actually a an outcome that doesn't um doesn't entail repression of our people <laughs> so nicely in, put in that world um what i will do is that i will get in the car and I'll be driving 16 hours to go see my baby play her first D1 game. Yay, <laughs> so I love that. I'll be doing that. I'll be back doing, to where we started. Yes, I will be doing that and um, and drinking some rosé and taking my taking my daily my daily walks. Um, I've been doing the daily walk thing since since the pandemic and you know 
they can show my lungs. You're doing something on Facebook, right? I have a yes, question. Yes, what is it called? Yeah, tell, so, tell yes, me. please tune in. It's called The Sip. Um, and it is um, Black Women. It's um, co hosted by Fatima Goss Graves at the National Women's Law yes. Center, Adrian Shropshire of Black Pack. Um, Tracy Sturdivant of the League and Glenda Carr of Higher Heights and it's a show on um, all kinds of issues for Black women including wellness and it actually started out because we were in pandemic and we started talking to each other just as friends and we were having check-ins with each other and I'm like you know why don't we share this this conversation mm -hmm. with people and then we decided that we would also like talk about politics um and leading up to the election so we cover all kinds of things including wellness we have chefs on sometimes we do brunch we do brunch online with our wine and everything and so um it's a lot of fun so it's um it's called the sip hour and it's on um facebook on um on youtube and on instagram so wow. check it check us out, out. And it happens like, is there a so we, Yeah, so we have Wednesdays at 2. Um, that's our power brunch. And then um, Sunday brunches at uh, 2 o'clock. Okay, so. so Wednesdays and Sundays at 2 p.m. The two SIP yep. hour. And mm -hmm. then also check out Advancement Project, advancementproject.org, yes. okay. to learn more about all of the issues that Judah talked about, from voting rights to education um, to the prison state and dismantling it. And... Um, Follow and please us. follow me and follow up and follow me on Judas, she's a prolific poster. This is true. Yes, on Twitter, but I ain't got no followers on IG. So I That's the show just got on it like, this year. Yeah, right? I, no, no, last oh, year. Okay, fine. I know it was recent. I know it was recent. Damn it. Because I remember. <laughs> Damn you were the it, it was me. last like, year. Did you follow me on Instagram? <laughs> So follow, can you tell them what your handle is? Yeah, it's just J Brown Diana. It's B R O W N E Diana. Yes. So I just okay, you can get followers. some new followers tonight. I know it. I know yeah, it. Yeah, I hope um, so. And, I hope so. Come on, young people, follow Auntie. That's what I am, Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Solidarity Semester Tuesdays, Thursdays. Next Thursday, we are going to be back here, and actually, we're going to be in conversation with Ahmed Abu Znaid. And um, yeah, yeah, I love him. I know he's great. So we're gonna have a great conversation with him, and um, we will see all of you for Solidarity Semester on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern on Zoom. Join us. Apply for our Power Up internships. And thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Judith. I love you. Thank you. Love Bye. You. Bye. Bye.